Hello, introductory astronomy class, and welcome to the final introductory astronomy lecture brought to you by Bella the Cat and me, Jamie Lombardi. Today we're going to be finishing up the chapter on life in the universe. Now, I know I usually start with the astronomy picture of the day, but Bella has asked me to start with the astronomy tweet of the day. This is from a NASA astrophysicist, Amber Strawn, and she recently wrote, actually discussed in a virtual meeting today how to keep cats from accidentally commanding spacecraft while this work is going on in people's homes on laptops instead of inside a cat-free NASA building. So there you go. That's the tweet of the day. Getting into the material, we'll go ahead and start to talk about section 19.4 on the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And when people talk about that, they often talk about the Drake equation. This is a way of estimating the number of civilizations that exist in the universe right now with whom we could potentially communicate. And the basic, basic idea is that that number is going to be determined by starting with the number of habitable planets. And then if you multiply that by the fraction of those planets that have life, then you get the number of planets that have life. If you multiply that by the fraction of those planets which have a civilization, meaning something smart enough to communicate over interstellar distances using, for example, radio wave communication, then you get the number of civilizations. If you multiply that by the fraction of those civilizations that exist now so that we could potentially communicate with them, we get the number of those civilizations now. And you could apply this equation to the universe um, or the galaxy. We'll do the latter. It's not clear exactly what numbers you're supposed to or need to, to be accurate, plug into the Drake equation. But we do know that there are about 200 billion stars in our Milky Way galaxy. And many of those, most of those, in fact, have planets, plural, going around them. And so conservatively, we could say that there are, uh, let's say, 10 billion habitable planets. Not all the planets will be habitable, but I think 10 billion is a conservative estimate. What fraction of those will harbor life at some point? Well, life did spring up quickly here on Earth. Um, but, you know, we don't see it elsewhere in the solar system and we haven't seen it elsewhere yet in the rest of the universe. So it's not clear yet if that number is going to be closer to zero or closer to one. Let's go with something in the middle. Let's say that one tenth of those habitable planets ultimately have some kind of life on it. It doesn't have to be intelligent life, but primitive life, for example, or more. What fraction of those planets that have life ultimately develop a civilization? Well, it took 4 billion years for that to spring up on Earth. Even though life came quickly, it took a long time before intelligent life, like the humans, came to be. And so it's, it's not clear whether or not that's going to be the case everywhere. And so, again, we don't know if this number is closer to zero or one, but we'll go with a tenth for now. So if you think about what we've done so far, we said there are 10 billion habitable planets in the Milky Way. One tenth of those would have life on it. So that means one billion planets in the Milky Way have life. And then one tenth of those would have uh, intelligent life, life smart enough to be called a civilization, to communicate over interstellar distances. And so that would be 100 million planets at some time in the evolution of this galaxy would have a civilization on it, 100 million. Now, what fraction of those civilizations are around right now? Again, this is going to depend on how long the civilizations can survive. If they can survive long term, then there's going to be a lot more of them around now. If they're not able to survive for long, well, then there's going to clearly not be many. So this is uh, highly unclear, but let's say you take a very pessimistic view. Let's say that you don't trust that the human species is going to live for more than an additional 4,000 years before we blow ourselves up or burn our planet to a crisp and our civilization um, um, goes by the wayside. And so if you take that scenario as representative of what would happen in general, 
Well, if a civilization typically exists for 4,000 years out of the 4 billion year history of the Earth, maybe you would make an estimate that um, one one millionth of the civilizations would be around at this given moment. And even so, if you take the 100 million planets that have a life on them at some point and you multiply by one one millionth, you end up with a hundred civilizations right now in the Milky Way galaxy with whom we could potentially communicate. Now, I'm not saying crazy things here. I'm saying things that other astronomers would say to you too. And, and I should note right off the bat that no one thinks, no good astronomer thinks that we've been visited by extraterrestrial civilizations, right? Occam's razor would tell us that there are much more plausible explanations um, for, uh, for conspiracy theorists' ideas about us having been visited in the past. But what I am saying is that the universe, and not just the universe, but the galaxy, is such a large place that uh, there is almost a certainty that there will be other civilizations out there. If you take a more optimistic view about how long civilizations last, and don't say, okay, well, um, they'll be around for 4,000 years, but you want humanity to exist for time scales that are comparable to the time scale for which their star exists, then maybe you would change that last number, F now, to be 1 100th. And in that scenario, the number of civilizations that exist right now with, with whom we could potentially communicate would be not 100, but a million one one hundredth of the hundred million life-bearing planets. And then the question is, okay, well, um, where are these other civilizations? Now, this leads us to ask, well, are we off the chart smart? There's different ways that you could quantify this. And here is a interesting graph. It shows on the vertical axis uh, the ma brain mass, the mass of the brain versus the mass of the body for different types of animals. There are primates shown here like chimpanzees and apes and so on, mammals like, uh, like cats and kangaroos and birds and so forth. And what you see is, not surprisingly, that as you get to larger and larger animals, their brains, on average, get larger and larger. Now, this is on a log-log scale. Each step that you go to the right is a factor of 10 in mass, or each step you go up is also a factor of 10 in mass. And you can see that humans were um, well above this best fit line to the data. And in some sense, you can take how far you are vertically above that line to be a measure of how smart you are. And we are, the um, of all these species shown here, the furthest above the line. That's uh, consistent with saying that we're the most intelligent, if you will. You might wonder, okay, well, is this intelligence that we have as a species, is this special? If you were to go to another planet, <laughs> oh gosh, if you were to go to another planet, and um, look and make a similar plot for the life forms there, would you find uh, an example of one that was so much smarter than all the others? And if so, then maybe that's an example of a civilization with whom we could potentially communicate. Or are we really just um, off the chart smart and we're not gonna find that elsewhere? Well, certainly we stand out from these data points. However, Whenever you have a spread or a distribution, just generally speaking, you're going to find outliers. And it's not like we are orders of magnitude higher than everything else here. This seems like our data point falls naturally as, an, as a, a somewhat of an outlier, but in the outer edges or wings of a distribution. And so in that sense, it's not too surprising if we eventually find out that on other planets there are other species that also are um, smarter, much smarter than the remainder of their uh, species on their planet and civilizations like our own. 
Now you might be curious as to which of these data points correspond to what kind of animals. And uh, you can see here, for example, the, the sperm whale, the blue whale, these are very massive objects. They have big brains um, overall in an absolute scale, but relative to their body mass, their brain size is small. In other words, they're below the line. Um, man, dolphins, chimpanzees, these are example of some particularly smart, if you will, species where their data point falls far above. And Bella wanted me to point out that the cats are just a little bit higher than the dogs on this graph. Um, I'm, not, I'm just reporting the data as I see it. Now, if you plot the brain size versus time, for um, what Homo sapiens, us, evolved from over time, uh, over the last 10 million years, you can see that our brain size has been increasing very quickly as of late. And so evolutionary pressures have taken this from a brain size, which is about 300 or so centimeters, up to currently nearly 1,500 cu cubic centimeters. And remember, four inches is a, a little bit more than uh, 10 centimeters. And so we're talking, if we're talking about 1,500 cubic centimeters, roughly speaking, um, something that is uh, equivalent to a cube, four and a half inches on each side. And so our brain size has more than tripled in the last 10 million years due to these evolutionary pressures on us. And so we certainly have been evolving very quickly into um, the species that we are. Now SETI is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And it's a real thing where people are looking for deliberate signals from an extraterrestrial intelligence. SETI's Allen Telescope Array in California, it's a little bit northeast of San Francisco, they search for radio signals from extraterrestrial civilizations. You can see why it's called an array. There's a number of these radio dishes, all the same as one another, pointing to the same point in space. Arecibo Radio Telescope is down in Puerto Rico. Um, this is a gigantic telescope that is nestled into the hills of Puerto Rico. And um, the way that uh, this works is that you can look for signals with Arecibo, but you can also do something that's called piggybacking. Whenever the telescope is pointed off in one direction of the sky, there's actually another direction of the sky away from it that it is observing. And um, as you look at real signals that you care about, pulsars or whatever they may be, you can also see in that other direction and hopefully maybe find, hasn't been done yet, but a signal from an extraterrestrial source. Maybe some repeating signal that uh, has a beat pattern that goes like uh, the prime numbers or something that, that the extraterrestrial species would know that uh, wouldn't be created naturally. And if it were observed by some civilization like our own, would be identifiable as an intelligent communication. It's not only that we're looking for signals from ETs, um, we've also sent a few signals ourselves. Perhaps the most famous one was sent in 1974 from the Arecibo radio telescope. And it is a grid which is uh, 23 pixels across and 73 pixels tall. And it was just sent out as a string of zeros and ones. Zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, you get the idea. And the idea is that if there were some civilization on the other end to pick up this signal, they would have to figure out how to put it into a rectangle. That hopefully wouldn't be too hard. Um, 23 and 73, those are prime numbers. And so, you know, you could try different combinations of numbers for width and height until something kind of snapped into place and you notice, oh, those are prime numbers. Uh, this must be somebody smart that's communicating with us here. Um, what you see at the top, and all of these things here have been colored just to make it easier to refer to, um, but at the top in white 
you have the numbers from right to left, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and so on. And then next you have some special elements from the periodic table. Hydrogen has atomic mass number one. You see that's one. And then carbon is number six. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, that's carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and phosphorus. They're giving the atomic numbers of these elements that are crucial to life as we know it on Earth. Not only that, in green they're showing us here the chemical building blocks of uh, DNA. They show us the double helix structure of DNA. And this in white is a number telling us the number of nucleotides in the human genome sequence. They even for whoever in, um, in the, whatever civilization would pick up this signal, show a picture of the human body. What a beautiful rendition, a little stick figure here of the human. Over in the side, they say how tall the human is using a fundamental unit of length. And over on the left, they give another number that shows at the time how many billion people were on the earth, a little more than four billion people. Now, this signal was sent to the M13 globular cluster. And the idea there is that in a globular cluster, you have many stars packed together. And presumably, there'll be planets around those stars. And the more stars and planets there are, the more likely you're going to stumble across one that had life on it. Now, M13 is 21,000 light years away. And so for that signal to get there will take 21,000 years. Imagine that there is some civilization in M13 that can receive it. They presumably will deliberate as to whether or not they want to respond. Let's say they do, then their signal coming back to us would take another 21,000 years to get to us. So we shouldn't expect an answer any sooner than 42,000 years in the future. It's not going to happen soon. However, if we are telling some civilization about where uh, we are, they'll know exactly where to come from this line here. It shows the sun. And then there's Mercury, Venus, and Earth. See how Earth is kind of budged up a little bit towards the human? We're telling them that Earth is the third rock from the sun. And that's where you can find the humans. And then it goes all the way out to um, the old, now dwarf planet, Pluto, which was considered a planet at the time. Down at the bottom, there's a picture of the Arecibo radio telescope with a number saying how big that telescope is. So... In the last section of the book, we talk about interstellar travel and its implications to civilization. Our current spacecraft travel at one ten thousandth the speed of light. And at that speed, it would take on the order of 100,000 years to get to the nearest stars. Um, we have spacecraft that have left the inner and now the entire solar system. Uh, those include the Pioneer uh, and the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. They're, they've all exited the planetary region of the solar system, and actually the Voyager spacecraft has recently left the um, solar system. The plaque on the Pioneer, it shows us uh, a more accurate drawing of what people look like. Here they're telling us that the time scale that we're going to use is associated with um, the spin flip in a hydrogen atom. These lines are showing the uh, 14 different pulsars which the extraterrestrial civilization that stumbles upon the pioneer could use to figure out where this came from. The, the information there actually is not only telling us about um, the direction of the pulsars, but their per periods at the time that the pioneer spacecraft was launched. And the periods of pulsars they get longer and longer and longer with time. So presumably the uh, extraterrestrial civilizations could, if they found this plaque and they wanted to know when and where it came from, they could measure the current period of those pulsars and then know what the period was when the Pioneer spacecraft left. They know the rate of change of the period and so they could figure out when this spacecraft was launched. And again, they'll know exactly where it came from if they figure out what star system it is because there's Mercury, Venus, Earth is the third rock from the sun, and that's where the Pioneer spacecraft was launched from. 
Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, they each had this golden record on it, which included some of the same information. I'll show you a zoomed up look at what's etched onto this golden record here uh, so that we can talk about it a little bit more. But there it is. In the upper left, they're showing a picture of the record as well as the stylus that was included with it so that they could play. They could play it. Here's the record as viewed from the side. And then there's some information over here about what's encoded on the record. There's um, some audio, which I'll play for you in a moment, but there's also video encoded on the golden record. And the, the idea is that this is giving whoever may stumble across this record billions of years into the future, perhaps, they give them information about how they can interpret and make use of the record. Um, they tell how many pixels are in the width and the height. And the first image that's shown is a circle. Um, they show the pulsar data again as well. Now, as for the sounds on the record, here, are, here is some of the audio. Um, it includes things like um, songs and the rainforest and people talking. Um, but here are some greetings in uh, different languages, 55 different languages. I'll play just a few of them for you. Adanish Lushulmo. So I encourage you to um, listen to more of what's on the Golden Record should you uh, so desire. Now, travel through interstellar space is going to be very difficult. Uh, the idea is that, first of all, you're going to need much more efficient engines than what we're currently using. There are ideas on how to do this with current technology, something called Project Orion, where you basically, on the back end of your spacecraft, set off nuclear bombs, which then propel you forward. And if you set off enough bombs, um, you get to accelerate, accelerate, accelerate. Remember, in interstellar space, there's nothing to slow you down. So if you speed up, it's not like when you're driving your car down the road, if you take off the, your foot off the accelerator, you slow down to a stop. Remember the first law of motion, an object in motion remains in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. So if you start going faster and faster, you'll continue with that speed. And if you accelerate more, you'll continue with your new speed without slowing down. Now, that Project Orion would require us to uh, be able to negotiate treaties that would allow us to put uh, nuclear explosions in space and so on. There's dangers associated with that. Um, but nevertheless, it is a way that you could imagine achieving speeds that would allow you to get to nearby star systems. The energy requirements are going to be enormous. You do need to worry about things like cosmic rays, which are very highly energetic particles. And even if they aren't already cosmic rays, if you're accelerating and moving, therefore, very quickly, now let's say there's some interstellar dust grain out there. It strikes the hull of your ship. You don't want it to make a little hole in the hull of your ship. And so things that you might not worry about if you're moving at slower speeds or could become potentially dangerous if you're moving at a fraction of the speed of light. There are also social complications of time dilation. Moving clocks run slowly. If you imagine sending your best scientists to the Alpha Centauri system, they might be um, gone for what on Earth is hundreds of years, even though for them maybe it was only um, dozens of years that passed. And so back here on Earth, technology has been advancing. If they were to come back, uh, then they would be sort of out of the loop because they would be from a, a, a previous era with outdated technology and outdated knowledge. All the people they know would have moved on, uh, would have passed away. Uh, and uh, if you're going to go and start to explore other star systems, you start to need to think about just moving whole branches of your civilization there 
and um, they may they may not come back right away, or they may become disconnected with what's occurring here on planet Earth. Now there are likely many other intelligent civilizations out there, and so that begs the question: Well, where are they? Enrico Fermi asks, given the statistical likelihood of other intelligent civilizations, why haven't we detected them? And there are a few potential answers to this question. One of them is that we are alone, that life and civilizations as we know them are much more rare than we might have guessed. And if you look at it from this point of view, um, our own planet, our own civilization is all the more precious. It could be that civilizations are common, but interstellar travel is not. Perhaps it's more difficult than we think, even more difficult than we think. Perhaps uh, other species don't develop and evolve to have that same drive to explore that we do. Or perhaps civilizations destroy themselves before they can achieve interstellar travel. Uh, the third possibility is that perhaps there is a galactic civilization and someday we will meet them. I say this somewhat jokingly, but it is mentioned as a possibility within your textbook and it's one to consider. Uh, the idea here is that the Drake equation tells us that there are a lot of civilizations that could potentially exist and maybe at some point in the future we'll be able to interact with them. Um, that brings us to the part of the lecture where we will now start to review. And we've done a lot this semester. And we're going to quickly give you a reminder of some of the highlights. These are things that I hope that you bring with you as you go forth in life um, I hope there are things that you remember about uh, astronomy and the universe that you live within. So in the first part of the book, we developed our perspective. We saw where we fit into the puzzle, we talked about how to observe the skies and what astronomy was. And I picked out a slide from each of the first three chapters that was my favorite. Um, the first one here from chapter one was the cosmic address, that the Earth was in the solar system, in the galaxy, in the local group, in the local supercluster, which was in the universe. In the second one, uh, here we're looking at the sun over 24 hours as viewed from the Arctic Circle on the first day of summer. And you can see here that the sun just kind of, uh, at midnight, skims the northern horizon before it goes back up high in the sky again. And so this reminds us that we're on a spinning ball and that we're lucky enough to have this brightly burning orb that we orbit around and that our view of the universe depends on where we are on that ball. And in the third chapter, you may remember we played Kepler's music of the spheres. Kepler was an amazing scientist. He was able to determine the laws of motion for planets orbiting the sun, even though he didn't understand the physics that gave that motion. And he had these ideas that the spheres gave off sounds, and the faster they moved, the higher the pitch of the sound. So maybe you could pick your favorite of these three and see if it's the same as mine. There's my favorite, the cosmic address. It reminds me of my place in the universe. It's humbling, but it's also inspiring to know what a big, beautiful, wonderful universe we exist within. There's that slide in more detail here. And uh, you can see where you can find me in Allegheny College, in Pennsylvania, in North America, on Earth, in the solar system, in the galaxy, in the local group, in the local supercluster, and in the universe. All right, well, in the second part of the course, we learned some key concepts. We need to understand some physics, how things move, why they move, how light interacts with matter, how it is emitted, and so on. 
And so here in those two chapters, my favorite slide from chapter four was when we talked about the astronauts landing on the moon and performing the experiment where they dropped a feather and a hammer. And in chapter five, we showed you some spectral tubes which emitted light and we saw that that light was broken up into its constituent colors. Now I picked the favorite here, it's a tough one. What's your favorite? I went with the exploration of the moon because after all, it shows our sense of exploration. It shows our power, it shows our control. Um, it shows that we're intelligent enough to figure out the laws of physics and then make use of those laws to get us to the moon. And then it's kind of nice that we're testing it there. You'll remember the quote from the mission controller back on Earth where they said, well, it's good that the test turned out the way it did because the ideas being tested when the feather and the hammer dropped side by side next to one another were the same principles that they would be using to get those astronauts back safely to Earth. Chapter five is a good one though too with spectral lines and so forth. In astronomy, a lot of astronomy is looking at light and a lot is encoded in that light. And so if you voted for five, I can see why you did it. Now in part three of the book, we talked about learning from other worlds. So we talked about our own solar system and the planets and other objects, asteroid, comets, and so on within it. And then we also talked about other planetary systems. So in chapter six, there's the earth and the moon. Chapter seven, why the sky is blue. Chapter eight, we explored Titan with the Huygens space probe. Chapter nine, the search for asteroids. Which of these would be your favorite? I know which one mine is. It's the Huygens space probe landing on Titan. Uh, it just gives me chills to watch those images as you land down on that moon, that moon of Saturn. And the landscape looks eerily like what you would see on Earth with mountains and runoff in the side of the mountains, except for there the runoff is from the liquid methane rain that falls on the surface. Okay, in the fourth part of the book, we talk about stars, starting with our own sun, then surveying other stars. We talk about how stars live and die and eject heavier elements, the same heavy elements that make up us. The carbon, the oxygen, the nitrogen, the iron, uh, all of those heavy elements that are in our body were forged in stars at some point in the past. All the heavy elements you see around you on Earth, those were made in stars or maybe in some collisions between neutron stars, but stars. And so to understand stars is to understand our beginnings. In chapter 11, we talked about pressure and pressure equilibrium. In 12, parallax. 13, we talked about supernova explosions. 14, we talked about time running at different rates and different gravitational fields. So I chose the rocket ships going around the black hole because this gives us a new look at what time is like. We grow up here on planet Earth, used to time advancing along seemingly everywhere at the same rate. And then we learn in our physics and astronomy courses that that's not the way that the real universe is, that the real universe is more rich and exciting and interesting than, than that. Now, in the fifth portion of the book, we learn about galaxies and cosmology, including the universe and how it behaves on its largest scales and what it was like far in the past and what it will be like in the future. And in this part of the book, I picked out these favorite slides, one of Sagittarius A star in the center of our galaxy. That's that region right there. And then the galactic center in its vicinity, the Hubble ultra deep field, the cosmic microwave background radiation, and then um, some lensing, gravitational lensing showing the existence of dark matter. What's your favorite among these? Mine is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. 
And we'll go ahead and zoom in on three of the galaxies in that deep field, an elliptical, a spiral, and a regular. If I could only show you one picture from that part of the book, this would be the one it would be. Now, in the final part of the book, we learn about life in the universe. There was only one chapter. We just finished it. You don't get to pick your favorite slide. It's got to be the slide with the tardigrade, the water bear. Who doesn't love a water bear after all? And it is impressive when you start to think about extremophiles and the types of environments that they can live in. Now, what is your overall favorite? The cosmic Address, the Apollo Astronauts, the Exploring Titan, Time Dilation, Hubble Ultra Deep Field, the Tardigrade. My favorite is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. If I could only show you one picture this semester, that would be the picture I would show you. You can talk about the universe on its largest scales. You can talk about the fact that the night sky is dark, is evidence that there was a Big Bang. You talk about the galaxies within it and the billions of stars within each of those galaxies, stars that have planets going around them, stars that evolve, that live and die and give their elements back to surrounding gases. And in those collapsing gas clouds, those heavier elements can, can congregate in the protoplanetary disks to form planets, and those planets can have life. We can talk about all the different topics of this semester uh, with the help of this Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Although the Hubble Ultra Deep Field is the one picture I would show you this semester, if I could only show you one, it's not going to be the last picture that I'll show you. The last picture is this. This is the picture of the pale blue dot taken by the Voyager spacecraft as it was leaving the solar system. Carl Sagan convinced the team of scientists to turn the Voyager cameras around, point it back towards Earth, and take this picture from a distance further away than a picture of Earth had ever been taken before. And because of scattering of light inside of the camera of the Voyager, you get these beams across the image, one of which just happens to go across that dot, and that dot is our Earth. And what I'm going to do is, rather than to discuss this any further myself, I'll allow Carl Sagan to give his explanation of this image and what it means to him. Consider again that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. I haven't played for you every sentence that Carl Sagan used to describe the pale blue dot, so I encourage you to seek that out and listen to it. The answer to today's reading quiz is pale blue dot. Pale blue dot. Hope you get it. And finally, I'd just like to thank you all for your hard work this semester. I'm glad that I got to know you uh, before spring break, before we went all back to um, our homes and other places. Um, I, I hope that you got a lot out of this course. I'm glad that I got to know you. To the seniors, I'm sorry that you had this disruption during your final year here at Allegheny. Uh, I hope that you get to come back in the fall and celebrate your years here at Allegheny in the graduation ceremony. To the uh, younger students in the class, I hope that you come back and visit me. And above all, I hope that you learned something in this astronomy course about uh, the universe, where we fit into it. Take care, stay safe, and Bella says bye.